And go back to sharing screens. Yeah, I go to. I appreciate your help and your patience. Yeah, yeah. He spells Alan's forgotten that he's chairing this. Probably. <laughs> Should I? <laughs> Uh, Alfred, should I just go ahead and start? I think Alan might have forgotten. Should I go ahead and start? <laughs> Where did I put that clicker? Alfred, I could be the speaker that needs no introduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the speaker really did need no introduction. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the organizers for all their hospitality. It's been a wonderful conference. Since this is the kickoff of the last day, will you join me in thanking the organizers for the conference? Okay, so here I am, this guy again, talking about uh, half factorial domains. What I hope to accomplish in this talk is to give you all kind of a picture of the history, what it's all about, some of the important results, and some new stuff, uh, which I hope will be kind of exciting. So in the beginning, uh, when it comes to half factorial domains, this was a, um, a problem of Narkevich. It was a challenge that was answered by Leonard Carlitz uh, in a paper in the Proceedings of the AMS in 1960. Uh, Narkevich asked for an arithmetic characterization of what it means to be class number two. Carlitz answered this with one of the sexiest papers ever written, two pages, two pages, including the references, right? Beautiful. And it inspired an entire industry of looking at non-unique factorizations. Uh, I also love to jam this one in Dean's faces too, because it appeared in the Proceedings of the AMS in 1960. Uh, if you look on Google Scholar, there's a smattering of uh, references uh, but it didn't really take off until 30 years after publication, right? Which is, of course, very different than what happens uh, in the life sciences. Here's the theorem. Uh, if R is a ring of algebraic integers, then uh, the class number is less than or equal to two. If and only if any two irreducible factorizations of the same element have the same length. Uh, Abraham Zachs in 1976, uh, as far as I can tell, seems to be a, the first person uh, to use the terminology half factorial domain. Uh, there were uh, two papers with essentially that title in 1976 uh, in the uh, bulletin of the AMS and in 1980 in the Israel Journal. Uh, here is Zax's definition, kind of interesting historically. Uh, R is an HFD if given any two irreducible factorizations in R, uh, alpha one up to alpha N equals beta one to beta M, then N equals M. Do you see what's missing? And the that's right. In the original definition, Zach's never assumed atomicity. Of course, a lot of the stuff he dealt with in the papers were atomic, 
uh, but nowadays um, it's industry standard. So when I say half factorial domain, I will indeed mean atomic unless otherwise uh, indicated. So um, I want to uh, say something about ideal characterizations of factorization properties. So everybody in here probably knows this. Uh, if you have a unique factorization domain, we have this really cool ideal theoretic characterization. Uh, it's not usually done in first undergraduate courses. In fact, sometimes not even in grad courses uh, or beginning grad courses. Uh, and it uses choice. Uh, theorem, let R be an integral domain, then R is a unique factorization domain if and only if every non-zero prime ideal of R contains a non-zero principal prime ideal, or if you like, uh, contains a prime element. Um, by the way, this uses uh, the axiom of choice, uses Zorn's lemma. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm here to, I don't, I don't know if you all know this. I, I didn't, I, every proof that I've ever uh, done used Zorn's lemma at some point or another. And I just found this out like in the last couple of years. Uh, how many of you know this theorem? Uh, by Wilfred Hodges from 1976, he, was, he does logic model theory. Um, the following two statements are not provable in ZF. Um, every PID is a UFD and every PID has a maximal ideal. So next time you use Zorn's lemma somewhere to prove that a PID is a UFD, you don't need to feel guilty about it, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, you, you actually, these are not provable uh, in, without choice. Um, so UFDs have uh, this ideal theoretic characterization. Every non-zero prime ideal contains a non-zero prime element. Uh, and actually, once you get over the hump of actually making that characterization, it makes some of the classical theorems about UFDs in a certain sense sort of smoother to prove. Uh, one of them is um, the fact that if R is a UFD, then it's polynomial ring is a UFD. Uh, that, in my opinion, that's much easier using uh, this ideal theoretic characterization. And the fact that if R is a UFD, a localization is a UFD is very easy given this characterization. And it, all, and, and it also very easily gives the equivalence, the well-known equivalence that uh, a principal ideal domain is a UFD of dimension no more than one. Um, now, for HFDs, there is no known <laughs> that I know of, uh, general ideal theoretic characterization uh, of what it means to be an HFD, right? I mean, UFDs you can talk about in terms of ideals, HFDs not so much. Uh, it is interesting to note that these two smoothies that we get out of UFDs for HFDs are not true. Uh, that is to say, there are HFDs out there in the zoo of commutative algebra whose polynomial rings do not have this property anymore. And uh, there are uh, HFDs whose localizations uh, are not HFDs. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we restrict to the case of rings of algebraic integers, Carlson's theorem now actually does give us an ideal theoretic characterization, right? Um, so in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, algebraic integers, Carlson said that it's an HFD if and only if class number is less than or equal to two. And it's interesting to note that in this case, the failures of Rx and Rs that happen in general for HFDs are actually, it's stable here. So if you have a ring of algebraic integers, it's polynomial ring, it's localization, uh, both of these still HFDs. Um, factorization, uh, factorization by its general, I mean, just, the way it is, when you're talking about factorization, you're almost always talking about something that's element-wise. You're talking about uh, how to factor elements into these irreducible elements or quarks, maybe, if you're very uh, um, uh, ambitious. Uh, you could couch this in terms of principal ideals, right? So you, you might say, how do you factor uh, principal ideals into maximal principal ideals? But still, that's that's, that's a little bit removed from the general situation. Um, for example, if you look at Netherianness, right, all ideals are finitely generated. 
This is equivalent to uh, ideals uh, satisfy the ascending chain condition. The ascending chain condition for principal ideals uh, is a, a strong enough condition, but it's much, much weaker than Ethereum. There are wildly non-Ethereum rings that satisfy ACCP. Uh, and so this sort of leads to sort of the first challenge, first question I think is good. Given a factorization type, um, find an ideal theoretic characterization for it. You're probably, for most of the, the, the factorization types that you might think of, you're probably not going to find something good that's going to work globally, but find a place, find a class of rings where you have an ideal theoretic characterization. My guess is you're going to get good theorems, right? Just like for uh, the Carlitz theorem when you look in rings of algebraic integers. Um, of the classical factorization types, uh, defined in the factorization and integral domains paper, which anybody that goes to a factorization conference has probably heard of this paper. It's a classic now, uh, JPAA 1990 by Anderson, Anderson, and Zafrula. Um, one might argue that HFDs are sort of the best you can do without being a UFD, right? You don't have necessarily unique factorization but you do have unique lengths of factorization. So it's almost at the, the, the top of the food chain. It's not the killer whale, but maybe it's the great white shark, right? Well, one of the strange things I've always thought about HFDs is even though they're sort of at the top of the food chain, they are arguably one of the weaker, um, one of the weaker factorization types when it comes to stability. Um, in fact, all of the factorization types that uh, are spoken of in that paper are preserved under polynomial extensions with the exception of half factorial domains and atomic domains. Um, ACCP, BFD, FFD, these are all preserved under uh, polynomials, but not under, uh, but, but not um, HFDs uh, and, and atomic domains as well, which is, that one has always just been really too weird for color TV for me. That's that's strange that atom atomicity is not preserved. But uh, thanks to uh, Professor Reutemann, we know that that's the case. Uh, HFDs are not um, necessarily preserved in polynomial extensions. We're going to talk about that uh, in, in a bit. Um, or localizations. And in fact, Chapman and Smith showed uh, a number of years ago, which is probably longer ago than I care to remember, uh, that uh, localizations for HFDs can even uh, fail in uh, some Dedekind domains with finite class group as long as the uh, distribution of the primes were bad enough. Um, so if you're sort of new to HFDs, I always think that when you're, uh, when, when you uh, think about a, a type of uh, domain, it's, it's always good to have sort of a, a toolbox of examples. Um, I think one of the best examples or best class of examples are these right here. HFDs as opposed to UFDs do not have to be uh, completely integrally closed or even integrally closed. And so if you look at these D plus M constructions, if you have F inside K or fields and you look at F plus XKX, so polynomials in K, but you restrict the constant terms down to F, or you can do the same thing with power series. Uh, these are always HFDs. These constructions always give you HFDs. And it's kind of cool because they give you UFDs if and only if F and K uh, are equal. Uh, another large class uh, comes from a good old source for us and that's uh, algebraic uh, number rings. Um, so, I'm going to look at uh, some HFDs. Uh, they're all over the place in algebraic number rings. Uh, in fact, class number two, but also uh, in subrings and then in orders, there's a lot of them. Uh, I'm going to narrow this down by only looking at orders in the field Q adjoined with the square root of D, where D is uh, a square free integer. So these are orders in uh, quadratic rings of integers. Um, so we're going to look at rings of this form. Uh, let n be a natural number. Uh, and we look at uh, z adjoined with n times omega. 
where omega is the square root of d if d is equivalent to one mod four and one plus radical d over two if d is equivalent to uh, two or three mod four. Uh, and I've got those conditions reversed. I, I didn't catch that till now. I'm sorry about that. Uh, actually, it should be reversed. It should be radical d if d is equivalent to two or three and uh, one plus radical d over two if d is equivalent to one mod. So when n equals one, these, this is the integral closure of z and the field q adjoined with square root of d. Uh, in fact, these are uh, integrally closed if and only if n is one. And so if n is a uh, natural number bigger than one, uh, you get these uh, interesting orders. None of them are integrally closed. And these have been uh, actually pretty well studied, uh, first by uh, Professor Halter Um And so it sort of appears that if D is bigger than zero, so if you're in the real case, so you have a real quadratic extension, uh, it appears that there are infinitely many values of n such that uh, z n omega is an HFD. In fact, even for a fixed value of omega, uh, so you have all these all these rings of algebraic integers, and for every ring of algebraic integers, you can sort of tunnel in by going n times uh, n times the uh, the basis generator. Looks like um, it looks like that even if if the integral integrally closed part is a HFD or a UFD, then infinitely many of these are, but it, it's, it's not known. Uh, I don't feel too guilty for this because it's actually still open in the case when N equals one and you're looking at the full ring of integers, uh, it's not known if there's infinitely many real quadratic UFDs. That, that's still an open problem. Uh, now in the imaginary case, uh, the norm is easier to handle as a matter of fact. So if D is less than zero, um, this is definitely not true. This is kind of a neat little theorem, I think. If D is negative, so you have something like negative one or uh, Q adjoined with square root negative three, the ring Z in omega is an HFD if and only if D is negative three and N is two. So in particular, the ring Z adjoined with the square root of negative three is the unique non-integrally closed imaginary uh, quadratic HFD. Uh, and it, actually this ring is gonna come back and haunt us several times. It is actually one of the more interesting examples uh, of an HFD. And it, uh, it, it's good for generating examples of a number of uh, things. So I'm gonna start with looking at polynomials. Right. Whenever you have almost any kind of nice ring theoretic property, uh, one of the first questions you ask yourself is, self, does this work in an extension? Is it stable when I go to polynomials, when I go to power series, localizations, whatever? And so we're going to look at HFDs um, and polynomial extensions. Um, I'm going to use Z uh, uh, adjoined with the square root of negative three, this uh, little HFD. One of the things that's, that's good about this, this ring, and one of the reasons why this one is, is so sexy and it works out really well, is this ring is the unique non integrally closed uh, HFD uh, in the imaginary case. Its integral closure is Z adjoined with uh, one plus radical negative three over two. A Z adjoined with the primitive cube root of one. Uh, that one, uh, its integral closure is actually a UFD. And it turns out that what makes this go is that every irreducible in the integral closure is prime. And if you take any of those primes up in the big integral closure, you can muck with it. You can multiply it by a unit and get it down into this. So the irreducibles here up to a unit are primes in the integral closure. That makes showing that this is an HFD easy. And actually it has some other interesting consequences we'll see later. So if you look at this HFD and then you ask yourself, what happens to the polynomial ring? Let's consider the polynomial 4X squared plus 4X plus four. Now I can factor this this way. Um, and it's, it's easy to see that this factorization works. 
notice um, on the left side, I have 2x times that crazy number, 2x uh, plus this, it's conjugate, right? Now, those two terms on the left side, the polynomials are linear, right? So they ain't getting any smaller with respect to degree. So the only way that I could break down those polynomials on the left-hand side is by pulling out a factor. Well, two and the constant term also are both irreducible elements in the small ring. So I'm stuck. I, you know, I get my big guns out and I try to pull, it doesn't pull out. There's nothing that comes out of that, right? So the two factorizations on the left are stuck. On the right, however, Notice that we've got a factor of four that I can pull out. And if you look at the uh, polynomial, the monic polynomial way over on the right, that one's irreducible as well because um, the element, the primitive cube root of unity is not in the smaller ring. And so the, one, uh, the, the, uh, the monic on the, on the right is, is already irreducible. So this is a, a very concrete example of... Um, failure of the HFD property in the polynomial ring. And actually, this is just an example, but you can take this example and just gratuitously rip it off. I mean, you can almost sort of <laughs> look at what's happening. The problem here, you want to pull the two out of that term that's way over on the left, but to do that, you have to have the primitive sixth root of unity here. And you can basically kind of rip that idea off uh, and get the following theorem. Uh, if the polynomial ring Rx is an HFD, then R must be an integrally closed HFD. What makes this example work is the fact that the, the smaller ring is not integrally closed. And so you can basically generalize this and play this game over any ring that's not integrally closed and, and, and get this. Uh, from this, we obtain the following uh, nifty little characterization. And this will lead to my second sort of challenge. Let R be an Ethereum ring. The following conditions are equivalent. Uh, Rx is an HFD. Uh, Rx1 up to Xn is an HFD for any N. Uh, R is a Kroll domain of class number no more than two. This comes from the fact that Zach's in uh, his paper in the Israel Journal showed that Rx uh, if R is a Kroll domain, then Rx is uh, an HFD, if and only if it's got class number less than or equal to two, because in a Kroll domain, uh, when you go to the polynomial ring, the primes are distributed nicely among the classes, and that's why you can get away with this. And Noetherian is needed because in the Noetherian case, integrally closed means Kroll, right? So my challenge is... Uh, what happens when you remove the adjective Noetherian here? Let me move on with this a little bit. And this is something that when it happened, uh, I sort of want to bet with Bill Smith over this one. Uh, it, it was because uh, I went back and I, it, it's kind of strange. So the necessary condition R is integrally closed is required for Rx to be an HFD. It is not required for our power X to be an HFD. So for example, once again, with our friend, the ring here, Z square root of negative three, Z square root of negative three power X is an HFD. Do you guys not think that's weird? I think that's totally weird, right? Because you have a ring R and it's got this nice HFD property. You go to its polynomial ring and you lose it because the thing's not integrally closed. Then you go to the completion, right? You go to R power X and it comes back, right? At first, I thought this was a mistake in a certain sense. Let me take you back kind of to the, let's look again at that factorization that we had. So we looked at this factorization here. The next thing that one asks itself is, okay, so this thing works for, 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 for polynomials. Uh, do I get the same thing for power series? Now, look at this factorization here. This is a bad polynomial factorization. Link two, link three, for sure. This is not a bad factorization in the power series ring because that crap way over there on the right is a unit, right? Huh. When I first saw this, I was like, okay, I, you know, I, I chose poorly. 
right? Uh, there's some other polynomial that it won't be a unit or whatever. As it turns out, I didn't choose poorly or well, uh, as it turns out, this thing, R, Z adjoined with square root of negative three power X, its power series is an HFD. Uh, the proof of this that I first did was rather complicated and it hinges very much on that fact that I told you before that if you look at Z adjoined with the square root of negative three and its integral closure, the primes upstairs in the UFD are all related by units to this. And then you've got to play this game. You've got to play this game with the power series and show that you can basically vary by units in the power series as well. This is something that you would not be able to get away with, uh, with polynomials. Um, so this is a rather dramatic example, I think, that we see that integrally closed, although needed for a polynomial ring to be an HFD, is not needed uh, for a power series ring. Okay, uh, continuing in the book of Job, uh, we are going to look at uh, the boundary map. Um, we recall <clears throat> the, an integral domain uh, is an HFD if and only if it admits a length function. Um, what is a length function? Uh, it is a well-defined function, uh, function's important here, uh, that sort of measures length is, and it behaves sort of like a logarithm. So uh, you want the length of the product of two elements to be the sum of the lengths, right? So you want that to be stable. You want the length of any unit to be zero and you want that to be an if and only if. And you want to be the length of an element X to be one. Um, if and only if X is an irreducible element. Uh, the definition of this can be expanded to the quotient field in a very natural way. Um, this is really uh, kind of a, a silly, I thought, rip off at first, but it does give something. So instead of looking at a length function on the ring, look at the whole quotient field. Um, and actually I'm, I'm lying a little bit, not the whole quotient field, let's throw out the zero element. The boundary map is a homomorphism from the non-zero elements of K into Z given by uh, the boundary of A over B is uh, the length of A minus the length of B. This is well-defined if and only if um, K is the um, quotient field of an HFD, and that's that L is the length function on that particular HFD. You need the lengths of the factorizations to be well-defined for this function to be well-defined uh, and so forth. Uh, it turns out that the boundary map is useful in studying overrings of HFDs, especially those that have nice integrality properties. So let me give you uh, an example here. Um, if R is an HFD and T is an almost integral overing of R, then the boundary of an element in uh, this extension is greater than or equal to zero. Um, oh, I'm just, I, I read that wrong. If R is an HFD and T is an almost integral overing, then this is what we call a boundary non-negative function. You can't have something of negative boundary, right? I mean, you can get negative boundary things like uh, if you look at the integers, which is certainly an HFD in the quotient field, if you take two divided by 25, that would have boundary negative one, right? But of course, two 25ths is not integral over the integers, right? Um, and in fact, if you have something that's almost integral, um, then the boundary is non-negative. And basically uh, the way it works is if you have something that's almost integral, that thing uh, is always in R, right? And so if you do the boundary to it, and it's easy to see, that if this if boundary of X is negative, then for large enough N, this will become negative, uh, which is a contradiction because this thing is in the original ring, right? So the boundary function actually works. It, it plays nicely with almost integral extensions. Um, 
And it turns out that if T is a, a boundary non-negative overing of R, with the additional property that no non-unit of T is of boundary zero, then T is atomic. And you can think of the, the boundary as sort of, I mean, it's almost like a Euclidean algorithm kind of thing. Take an element in T and factor it. Well, the boundary gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If you can't have a non-unit of boundary zero, then eventually you have to stick because when you get the boundary small enough, when you start having to pull out boundary zeros, they're all units and it doesn't make any difference. Um, if in addition, uh, and this is the utility of the boundary function. So if it's boundary non-negative uh, and it, stronger than that, if there's no non-unit of boundary zero, then it's atomic. Uh, if in addition, all irreducibles of T are boundary one, then T is also an HFD. So this would seem like it's a kind of a good path for exploring this kind of stuff. Um, so this brings up a central question concerning HFDs. When is an overing of, a, a, of an HFD again an HFD? This is maybe a, too much of an ambitious question because this isn't really well known for UFDs. So we might restrict to the case of integral or almost integral extensions because then we, uh, we have some, uh, the boundary to help us out. So, uh, oh, here we go. Theorem, if R is an HFD, uh, and it's an order in a ring of algebraic integers, then the integral closure of R is also an HFD. The boundary uh, is, is used to, to show that effectively. Unfortunately, we've got this. Uh, here is a theorem, uh, originally by me, uh, and then later and better by Mo Moshe Reutemann. Uh, the integral closure of an HFD need not be an HFD, uh, even atomic. The first example was given by me, and I cheated, cheat, cheat, cheat. And the way I cheated was I constructed an HFD whose integral closure was not atomic. So even though I might feel very proud of myself for that, I don't think Zach's would approve, right? Because he never assumed atomic anyway. Moshe Reutemann uh, uh, gave an example uh, not too long ago of an HFD whose integral closure was actually atomic, but failed to be an HFD. Uh, so hopefully I've conveyed to you that maybe an important step to understanding this behavior in integral, almost integral closure, uh, could be facilitated by the re resolution of this boundary zero problem. Um, here is a conjecture. If R is an HFD and T is an atomic integral, oh, atomic is going to be uh, important in this, then T has no non-units of boundary zero. Let me point out that there exists integral overrings that have boundary zero non-units. The example that I did for the integral closure of an HFD uh, not being atomic is actually one of these. There are in this strange ring uh, boundary zero um, elements of the integral closure. Uh, but again, my ring is not atomic. Uh, also, if you look at the extension z plus 2xzx inside of zx, it turns out the bottom one is an HFD. Uh, it can't be a UFD because it's not completely integrally closed. The top one's a UFD. Uh, and x, which is 2x over 2, 2x and 2 are easily shown to both be boundary 1. They're both irreducibles in the bottom ring. So almost integral is not good enough for the conjecture. So see what you can do with that. OK, link factorial, uh, link factoriality. Uh, historically, this was originally called the OHFM, if you're talking about monoids or D property, uh, OH being the other half. Uh, a UFD has two proper, oh, an, a UFD is a domain that's atomic that has two properties, two irreducible factorizations of the same thing or the same length, then you can pair them off. Other half means forget about being the same length when they're of equal length, you can pair them off. Uh, Felix Gotti in our recent paper uh, talked us into using link factorial, which is a much more sensible but much less amusing terminology, uh, but we're going to go with that. Um, so what it means to be link factorial is maybe it's, it, it doesn't, uh, it has, it's not unique factorization. It has elements that factor in 
different lengths, but if you have two uh, factorizations into irreducibles of the same length, uh, it must be unique. So for any n, a given element has at most one factorization of that length. As monoids, these exist all over the place. Uh, any two generated uh, numerical monoid, in fact, you can remove the adjective numerical, has this property, uh, but this is not so in the setting of uh, integral domains. Uh, theorem by uh, me and Bill Smith in 2011, if R is an atomic length factorial domain, then R is a UFD. That's interesting because as monoids, uh, length factorial exists all over the place. It cannot be done in domains without making it trivially uh, a UFD. So in the monoid two, three, we have the factorization. Almost everybody's seen this, right? Two plus two plus two is three. And it turns out in this monoid, two and three are the only irreducibles. Everything is a sum of, of these two animals. Um, it's an easy exercise to show that every non-unique factorization in this monoid is, is after, if it's, if it's not redundant. I mean, what do I mean by redundant? Well, I could certainly do this, couldn't I? Two plus two plus two plus three equals three plus three plus three. I would consider that redundant, right? Because you can sort of cancel these off. Now, there are only two different irreducibles here, two and three. And so if a factorization is non-redundant, you, uh, you have to have things separated out. You have to have twos on one side and threes on the other. Um, and it turns out that every factorization that you find that's not unique and not redundant in this thing is actually a superposition of that one master factorization. This is the one that controls it all, the master factorization. And despite the time-honored tradition in our field, I will not abbreviate that terminology. Um, this non-trivial factorization works well in monoids, but it's not compatible really with domains. Uh, you should also note that in the above factorization, two is what I call a long irreducible because it's on the long side, right? The side that's got three irreducibles. And three is what we call a short. We'll make this more precise. Let M be a commutative cancellative atomic monoid and X an element of M. We say X is purely short. Uh, there is a distinction. I am going to use short and purely short synonymously here. So I apologize for that. We say X is purely short, respectively purely long. If whenever we have a factorization, like this, X is purely short if it always appears on the short side of a non-redundant factorization. We say it's always long if it always appears on the long side of a factorization. Um, and this leads us to something interesting. Uh, theorem, Scott Chapman, me, Felix Gotti, and Bill Smith, 2021. In any atomic monoid, the set of long irreducibles, purely long, and the set of purely short irreducibles are both finite sets, which is interesting. Additionally, in an integral domain, at least one of these sets has to be empty. You cannot have a purely short existing in the same place, it's like matter and antimatter, uh, with a purely long. And of course, I'll answer the next question. I know it's coming. Uh, one can construct Dedekind domains, and we constructed one for each, to show that there are domains where you have a purely long irreducible, no purely short, and you have a purely short, but no purely long. In, in a domain, generally speaking, these things are kind of rare, because usually anything that can appear on the short side of a factorization, if you muck around with it a little bit, you can find some different element where it appears on the long side. Uh, so there's some work that went into this. Um, now, now my poem to domains that uh, I like so much. One can argue that the purest form of factorization theory happens in monoids. I mean, that's really down to brass tacks, right? It's very monoids. It's just that one operation. All you're thinking about is the factorization. Uh, but I, I, I am I'm in love with my mistress, the... Uh, domains, they're still very sexy. Uh, 
it's just that additive thing, that extra binary operation gets in the way sometimes, right? So here's a theorem that has some relevance in this regard. Uh, and this will bring me up to another challenge. Uh, let M be any reduced cancellative torsion free monoid. Then there exists an integral domain with atomic factorization structure isomorphic to M. What do I mean by that? Walk up to me on the street and hand me a, a nice monoid like this. I can build you an integral domain. Uh, let me change that. Walk up to me on the street and give me an atomic monoid like this. I can build an integral domain where if you look at what's generated by the atoms in the monoid of the, the do, uh, in the multiplicative monoid of the domain, it will be exactly what you gave me. The construction that we do to do this is never atomic, ever, right? So even if you give me something like the, 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 the natural numbers, the construction will actually build something that's not atomic. So for example, the monoid generated by two and three, the theorem by uh, uh, me and Smith says that there is no link factorial domain that's not a UFD. So you cannot have that as the total um, multiplicative monoid. This thing allows you to build an integral domain that has that as the atomic part of the monoid, but it necessarily must have non-atomic crap in it, has to, right? Now with the natural numbers, there's no has to here. So uh, this, this brings up a question and I think this is hard. And so I'm gonna be mean to a graduate student and give it to him. So if anybody answers this before the end of the thing, be sure and let me know so I don't torture the person further. Uh, classify the reduced atomic monoids that exist as the reduced monoid of an atomic integral domain. So which monoid, and I can tell you one that doesn't, uh, the, the numerical monoid generated by two, two and three. I can tell you one that does, the natural numbers. Which ones work, which ones don't? I, th I Actually, I think this is kind of a hard question to answer completely, but prove me wrong. Um, okay, so now we're on to revelations. Uh, we kind of skipped all the gospels, but that'll be for you all to write. Um, theorem. Um, Jason Boynton, me, and Chelsea Morrow, uh, still in preprint form. Uh, let R be an order in a ring of algebraic integers and R bar its integral closure. There is no non-unit of R of boundary zero with respect, uh, boundary zero with respect to R. This answers that question I asked earlier about the boundary zero non-units, <laughs> but it answers it in a very, very specific case, right? These are orders and rings of integers. It doesn't get any sweeter than that. So there's a still a lot of unknown stuff out there on that. This can, uh, we use this to leverage this uh, into the following, which I affectionately call the squeeze theorem. Um, if R is an order in a ring of algebraic integers with integral closure R bar, and T is an intermediate ring, uh, of course, it's also an order in a ring of integers, then T is also an HFD. So in other words, and I, I'll kind of throw this out, the challenges here, R is an HFD, R bar is an HFD, that was known earlier, but now anything in between there is an HFD. So in a certain sense, elasticity zero, or I'm sorry, elasticity one, elasticity one forces the middle one to be elasticity one. So here's some questions. Um, just for giggles. When is the integral closure of an HFD, uh, an HFD, uh, I'm a, yeah, R is an HFD. Uh, when is the complete integral closure of R and HFD? Uh, number two, when is an overring T of R boundary positive in the sense that there's no non-unit of T of boundary zero? Uh, this is not even generally known when, when T is integral over R. Um, I, may be true, I'm not sure. Uh, the answer to this might be instrumental in making forward progress with understanding uh, overrings of HFDs. 
Um, given two HFDs are inside T, and these exist in abundance, right? Like in, in orders and rings of integers, they tend to be HFDs as you go up. Uh, what is the relationship between uh, the boundary of R and the boundary of T? They both have boundary maps, right? What's the relationship between these? Um, and here's a more general question about this. Basically, if you look closely, the boundary map basically functions like a valuation to the specific group Z. It, it doesn't have that uh, some minimal property, so it's not a valuation, but it's, it behaves like that. Given a field and a function um, from F star to Z satisfying boundary of AB as boundary of A plus boundary B, when can boundary be realized as a boundary function for some HFD? R and F with F being the quotient field of R. Um, and finally, is there an elasticity squeeze theorem? Uh, the previous one that I did here, uh, another way to interpret this is if R and R bar are elasticity one, then the intermediate one has elasticity one. Uh, what if the elasticity of R and R bar are two? What if the elasticity of R is two and the elasticity of R bar is, it, it tends to go down actually, but I mean, is there some kind of squeeze theorem like this? That's what I mean by that. And finally, uh, on the power series front, um, and I think this is kind of interesting, um, so this is a, also a preprint that will probably be submitted by the end of the summer. Me and Grant Moles, who is uh, a, one of my current students, and he also he's also partially responsible for some of that other stuff. So I'm still kind of sorting that out. Um, let R be an order in a ring of algebraic integers with integral closure R bar and conductor ideal R. If I is a radical ideal, so as, as, a, as an ideal in R bar, R bar is a Dedekind domain, so you can write it as a product of primes. If there's no ramification, so I is a radical ideal, then R is an HFD if and only if its power series is an HFD. Now, I think that's kind of weird, uh, and I think that's a really cool result, because this, my friends, is a huge contrast with the polynomial case. If you're not integrally closed, then uh, Rx will never be an HFD. Uh, but here uh, it's in lockstep with what happens in the power series case. Um, so that's that. Thanks to the organizers and thank you all for listening. Yes, sir. Awesome. I didn't listen. In all the preprints you have mentioned. What's that? In all the preprints, are they available already? Or I I can send you. Yeah, I'll be happy to do okay. that. Yeah, just okay. just drop me an email. Yep. Okay. There's actually two of them, I think. <laughs> I, I've done this a couple of times and nobody has ever asked me before. AB is me. I know. What is it? Appalachian beefcake. <laughs> I've been waiting for years for somebody to ask that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's not my blood type. It's just, yeah, somebody called me that once and I've made it up. <laughs> Yes. You mean the one we proved or the one I was conjecturing about? So what happens is, is you have intermediate rings. Um, so we're in a ring of integers case. So when you mod out by the conductor, you get finite rings and you make an argument about the units, right? So what you have to do is, there, there's a lot of stuff in this because one of the things is, is every element down in the bottom ring varies from a unit from the upper ring. Everything of boundary one is basically, uh, this all comes up in proving that there are no boundaries, zero non-units, right? 
then what you do is you look at kind of the unit structure uh, between, so you got the intermediate ring T, so you have R mod I inside T mod I instead of R bar mod I. And what you have to do at that point is you have to show that, um, so what you have to show is, every irreducible here is basically reflected down here, right? And R bar is U, U, U of R bar times this. The thing that can go wrong here is you might have two irreducibles here that are clumped with a unit and you can't separate it out in the middle ring. And actually I found it easiest to mod out by the conductor and you use kind of a unit argument to show that this in fact can be broken up. So then what you have in the middle ring is, is, is all the irreducibles are a boundary one and, and you're good to go. That's essentially it. Let's stop in two minutes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor